Hey, welcome back to Online Worship with Emmanuel Presbyterian Church on the Internet Hood. It's great to see you. This coming Saturday from 8 to 9 is Casa Maria. So bring your already prepared lunches to the church parking lot. Drop them off as we seek to be a blessing to those uh, who are hungry in Tucson. We are honored in our worship service today to have the Reverend Bailey Pickens, who's with PCM, Presbyterian Campus Ministry, to share about that wonderful ministry to U of A and other college students in our area. So we welcome her to our worship. We are needing to suspend our outdoor worship services due to increased cases of COVID in Pima County. Uh, we're going to look at it week by week, so we'll be sure to update you when the, it's appropriate for us to start our outdoor worship services again. But whether it's rain or shine, high numbers or low numbers, we come to worship the living God who is present with us wherever we are. Even when we're the scattered church, we are gathered together in Christ Jesus our Lord. So come and worship the living God together. Today, as we prepare for worship, we want to express our gratitude and our appreciation uh, to those in our congregation and beyond who have served in our nation's military. If you are a veteran watching this, we salute you. We thank you for your service and for your sacrifice protecting our country. Your service enables us to enjoy so many freedoms, like the one of being able to worship together. Your sacrifice is not taken for granted. I'd like to invite Emmanuel um, and all those that are watching to personally give a word of thanks to a veteran this week if you happen to see them or maybe even write a thank you note um, during this week of uh, where we celebrate Veterans Day which will be observed on November 11th. Thank you again for your service. Let us pray. Lord, we give our lives to you, our mind and all its thinking, our heart and all its loving, our strength and all its working, our soul and all its worshiping. We give ourselves to you and seek to serve you and our neighbor. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. <laughs>
please join me now in the call to worship. In God alone is my soul at rest. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock, my salvation, my fortress. Never shall I falter. In God alone be at rest, my soul, for my hope is from him. In God is my salvation and glory, my rock of strength. In God is my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our refuge. Woke up this morning, life as you know it Looks nothing like the kind of life you knew before All of a sudden, fear stole the headlines don't feel safe to even step outside your door In this world you will have trouble But I have overcome the world So take heart Take a breath Let me lift that heavy weight up off your chest Take my hand I know it's looking dark When the world falls all around you I won't let you fall apart So take heart Take heart Do you remember singing Back when you were younger He's got the whole world in his hands that's still true I hold your family All your friends and all your loved ones Even when you're barely holding on I'm holding you So take on Take a breath Let me lift that heavy weight up off your chest Take my hand I know it's looking dark This week we asked children to tell us about their best friend. Here's what they had to say. Uh, it's Gabe and Liam and Jacob. They like me, but sometimes Gabe off. Sometimes just likes the little bike. He likes to ride on it. And Jake and sometimes Jacob wants to play with somebody. And sometimes Liam wants to play by himself and and that's all. Pa and Papa is the best person. My everyone is my best friend like Janine or Shanna. I care about them and then them care about me. Is that it? Mm -hmm. 
Phoebe, tell us about your best friend. He's furry, he's cute, and he's a good listener. Um, Adam's my best friend, and I like him because he's um, less speedy than me. He's less speedy than you? Yeah. Okay. I heard a story this week about an elephant that made friends with a dog at an animal sanctuary. The dog got really sick and had to stay at the animal hospital at the sanctuary. The elephant wouldn't leave the door to the animal hospital. She was waiting for her friend. The vet even brought the dog out one day to see the elephant. The dog got better and the two are still friends today. God wants us to be good friends to people. He wants us to help others and be there for each other. Thanks for being my friend. I appreciate each and every one of you. Please join me in prayer. O Lord our God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 18 through 24. Let's hear the word of the Lord to us. Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another, just as he commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit he has given us. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. Thanks be to God. Jordan Blaschick, a Republican Marine, and Chris Howe, a Democrat from Berkeley, they forged an unlikely friendship together while they were in Yale Law School. On a whim, they decided to go on a road trip to better understand each other and the country they love. They attended a Trump rally in Phoenix together. They rode in the cab with a truck driver going through Louisiana. They went on a lobster boat with a fisherman from Maine. And they watched prisoners in Detroit perform a Shakespearean play. Three years, 44 states, and nearly 20,000 miles on the road together, they ended up writing a book about their friendship and their road trips. It's called Union a Democrat, a Republican, and a search for common ground. And I can't recommend this book enough. It's a wonderful read, um, especially in this politically polarized time that we find ourselves in right now. Now, there were a couple moments in the book where you wondered, are these guys going to stay friends? But through the ups and downs, these two very different friends model not only what it looks like to live with one another, but to love one another. Even if the other in our life happens to be affiliated with the other party. Looking back on their road trips together, they saw how their views and their positions became more nuanced. Uh, they became more empathetic towards the opposing view. They kept one another honest, balancing each other's views and helping one another see each of their blind spots. They also realized after these trips, their positions hadn't really changed all that much. Yet both of them had moved, moved towards one another rather than against one another. 
They realized politics were never going to unite them. They saw that politics needed to be put in their proper perspective, in their unique friendship. But there were other important things that could keep them connected, even though they still cared about politics. Their conversations, their efforts to understand one another, and their desires for goodwill towards our country drew them closer, despite the differences that still remained. They had to tend their unique friendship because it was tender. They they couldn't go on autopilot with easy go-to commonalities. No, their, their friendship, it meant something because it didn't come easy. For them, the key was hope. Hope held the union of their friendship together. And they both came to the conclusion that it was hope that would hold together the fragile union of our United States of America. They realized that only together, even in the midst of their disagreements, only together could they make things better. They were allies, not adversaries, even though they were different. Now, there's a similar idea going on here in our scripture reading. The Apostle John is saying to us, love one another. And one another means everybody. With God's love in our hearts, you can love and you can disagree at the same time and still be connected. You see, it's God's love that makes it possible for us to have a more perfect union, whether it be with God Almighty by His grace or with our fellow countrymen of all stripes and stars. We can love from the bottom of our hearts. And so the Apostle John's message for us, it's so simple, yet so profound and so challenging. It's not easy. It's a struggle. Let us love, he says. Literally translated, it's let us go on loving. Let us go on loving because God first loved us. Love is from God and God is love. God loved us before we loved God. God is our first love. You see, this truth empowers us. To love not merely in talk, tongue, or theory. We can go beyond lip service in our lives. We can rise above it all. We can take it to a new level when God is with us. We can love, as John says, in truth and in action. True love that's practiced in the real world of our day-to-day lives in the thick of life. Now, the Apostle John, he's coaching us right now. And he's mentoring us on how to live authentically so that our thinking and our actions can be a work of heart. You see, when we love one another, says John, God abides in us. And God's love comes to perfection in us. And perfect love casts out all fear. And so we can take heart because God has reassured our hearts. But there are times in our lives when our hearts don't feel all that reassured, like maybe now. In fact, how are you feeling right now, this election week? If you took a stress test, if you got on that figurative treadmill of life, what would your heart condition be right now? Fearful? Uncertain? Elated? Exasperated, exhausted, devastated, angry, stressed out, all the above. The Apostle John's church was experiencing many of these same feelings. It wasn't because of an election or because of a pandemic. For them, it was would-be prophets with their competing claims that were blowing the believers off course. They were saying, love for God has no connection to love for neighbor. Basically, these would-be prophets were saying, if you love Jesus, it doesn't matter how you treat others. 
And so their ideas and teachings were creating dissension and doubt in the church. And so the Apostle John is bringing a calming voice to the situation. He says in the next chapter, test the spirits, use discernment, listen carefully, pray, sift, and weigh what you hear and what you feel. You see, for John, the test is this, love. Do a heart check. Is God's love at work in your heart? Is love at work here in this situation? See, Emmanuel, the good news is that no matter how you're feeling right now, whether you're brokenhearted, heavy-hearted, faint of heart, or your heart is leaping and skipping a beat right now, God is greater than our hearts. God is greater than the fluctuations of emotions that we feel inside. God is greater than the chaos and uncertainty going on outside us. You see, despite these very real promises given in God's word, it's still natural for doubts and fears and frustrations to creep into the human heart. It's totally normal and expected. Our soul can feel flooded by self-criticism or self-doubt. It's, it's that voice in our head that tells us we're an imposter. John describes it as our heart's condemning us. Now, in these times of second guessing, Jesus says this to us, take heart. God is greater than our hearts. God knows everything. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. God knows everything. He knows your faults. He knows your flaws and your foibles. He knows them better than you know them. And he still loves you through and through. Now there's a French proverb that says, to know all is to forgive all. God knows everything about you, and he still forgives you. God not only knows our shortcomings, he knows our heart, he knows our yearnings, he knows our intentions. He knows those times when that nobility within us just didn't quite see the light of day. God sees our longings that didn't come to fruition and our dreams that never came true. So, set your heart at rest. God looks at the heart. Our merciful God looks for love in our hearts, no matter how feeble or fledgling it is. But he also improves our heart condition. He pours his love into our hearts and he draws it out of us. He looks for it. God perfectly knows us. God loves us. And perfect love casts out all what? Fear, as the Apostle John says. And so with reassured hearts, we can approach Almighty God fearlessly, confidently, bold, and free before our God. No matter what life throws our way, no matter how things pan out in winning or in losing, in waiting and in acting. You see, our real trust is in God. It always has been, no matter our circumstances. If you like the president or if you don't like the president, our task and our calling as Christians remains the same. Nothing has changed. We can pray, we can be at peace, we can live life, we can walk in grace, we can love God and neighbor. You see, we're free. Emmanuel, we're free to live wholeheartedly. We're free to be perfectly imperfect in an imperfect world. We live in and we live through Christ's selfless and limitless love. You see, it's in times like these, that God helps us not only call to mind, but God helps us call to heart that we are forgiven. That we're God's children by grace. And those around us are God's children by grace. And because we're forgiven, we can be forgiving. Because we know that God does what is pleasing for us, we then have a desire to do what is pleasing to God. 
We'll boldly run into God's presence knowing that we're going to be welcomed with open arms. That God has the time for us. That God cares about us. God takes interest in us no matter how we're feeling. You see, when we seek to obey God in our imperfect ways, we find ourselves in union with God. A union of wills. We want to ask for God's will rather than ask out of selfish motives. You see, the Scriptures teach us, and the Apostle John teaches us, belief and love, they go hand in hand. They're made for each other. Neither are sufficient without the other. Right belief and right action are inseparable. You must have Christian theology and a Christian ethic. There is no Christian ethic without a Christian theology. There's no Christian theology without a Christian ethic. You can't pick and choose. A batting average of 500 in this situation will not do. We need to be two for two. Right belief, right action. Belief and love. Love and belief. You see, when we get in that sweet spot of experiencing not only blessed assurance, but God's blessed reassurance, when we find ourselves believing and trusting, not in ourselves, not in our circumstances, not in our candidates, but in the name of Jesus, we are in a really good place. And with reassured hearts, we will be a praying people. And through prayer, we are going to experience a deeper and richer reliance and trust upon our God. But not only that, we'll also love one another the way that Christ loved us. Now notice in our passage, John says, love one another. He doesn't say, love only those who are like you, or only love those who like you. God expects much more of us than that. Also, love the person who voted differently from you. Love the person who disagrees with you. Love one another, everybody. This is how God's love functions in our lives. You see, John says in the chapter before that hatred is a sign that we're living in the dark and not in the light. Our horizontal love for our neighbors, all it is is just a continuation of of our vertical love for God. And so, when we find ourselves believing in the name of Jesus, in loving our neighbor, we find that we are synced up with God. We're on the same page. Or as John puts it, we will dwell in God or abide in Him. We'll be in union with Him, living deeply and surely in Christ Jesus, and Christ abides in us, us, both individually and individually and collectively as a church. The Holy Spirit in us also assures us that the deep and abiding presence of God is with us and in us. God stays with us and we stay with God and we can stay with one another. We experience union. We experience unity because we are united by the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit helps us to fulfill the gift of Christ's commandment to us that we love one another. You see, it's all interconnected. It's seamless. When we are believing in Christ and we're loving one another, relationships are not only at the forefront of our minds, relationships are at the forefront of our hearts. We can take heart because we have a reassured heart. Amen.
friends in Christ, thank you for giving me a little bit of your time today to talk to you about what's happening on campus. My name is Bailey. I'm the director of the Presbyterian Campus Ministry at the University of Arizona here in Tucson, and I want to tell you what's happening. It's been a weird year. Might have been a weird year for you too. The COVID-19 pandemic has meant that all kinds of institutions, the university included, have had to change very quickly and almost completely. But a blessing in the midst of it is that precisely because our group is small, we have been able to continue to meet in person. This semester, we've been doing Bible study, having fellowship, and even providing time for students to do homework with other people there for camaraderie and moral support, outdoors, masked, distanced, and in person. But the other thing that is really the challenge we're trying to meet, even apart from the pandemic, is just that things are different than they were a generation ago. Maybe you've noticed that things are different in your congregation than they were a generation ago also. People don't join things just to join them. It's not true anymore that if you build it, somebody will come. And so PCM has been moving from a more established and self-contained model, something like um, a continuation of what you might see in a high school ministry, to something we may even call missional. We have left the building. We meet outside. We encounter students outside. We seek to meet people where they are so that we can give them what they need. Young people today know more about themselves and the world than perhaps they ever have. And you and I both know that there is plenty in the world that is dark and frightening or deeply sad. But the truth of the gospel, that God who made this world loves us, came to be one of us and chose to die to make us free, that news is as good and as needed as it has ever been. It is the only thing that keeps me going. And so my work on campus is to find the students who need a safe place to know this, somewhere that they can meet Jesus without having to hide any piece of themselves. And that work, though it's challenging, though it's not like the world I grew up in, is exciting to me. And I think that the new world is in it. If this sounds exciting to you, I would encourage you to check out our website. It's pcmarizona.org because PCM is sustained by you, by your prayers and by your giving, by 
everyone crying out to God together for our good, and by the generosity of congregations and individuals who are as excited by and invested in this work as I am. On our website, you'll find every possible way you can give and even more opportunities to be involved. We're always looking for board members. We need people to mentor students, to provide rides for church one day when we can be in church together again. Reach out to me. I would love to hear from you. I would love to answer any questions that you have. We need you, and this is good work. Thank you for giving me some of your time, and I invite you to join me in praying for the well-being of all of the students at the university, and that God might hasten the day when all of us are going to be able to come together in praise and in worship in person again. We move now to a time of guided prayer. Position yourself in your seat, with your feet flat on the floor. Put down your phone, get comfortable. Close your eyes, slow down and clear your head. Slowly draw a breath in through your nose and hold it for a few seconds. Then slowly exhale through your mouth. Take some time to give thanks to God. Lay down at the feet of Jesus your concerns, the tensions, the fears, the questions, the pent up frustrations swelling and swirling in you. Let go of your concerns about pandemic or maybe the election, any events in our country or our world that are weighing on you, or maybe ailments that you or any of your loved ones might be undergoing. Give them into God's loving hands. Breathe in God's spirit and the peace that he offers. Exhale the negativity and anxiety and let the Holy Spirit detox your body. Let the Spirit detox your mind and your soul. Let your turmoil, your stress, the tension be transfigured into prayer, trust, One of the time-honored ways of praying for Jews and Christians over the centuries has been praying the Psalms. And so I'd like to guide us in a mindfulness and heartfulness prayer adapted from Psalm 139. Lord, you search me and you know me. You know my resting and you know my rising. You know my comings and my goings through and through. You discern my thoughts from afar. Before a word is on my tongue, O oh God, you know it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb to the heights, you are already there. If I descend down into the depths, there you are waiting for me. You hold me fast. You are with me. God, the darkness can't hide me from you. To you, darkness is as light. You, O oh God, formed my inmost being. I thank you who fearfully and wonderfully made me. That my soul knows well. And so search me, God, know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See that there is no wicked way in me and lead me in the way of eternity. And God, I pray this prayer not only for myself, 
I pray this prayer for my loved ones. I pray this prayer for the church. I pray this prayer for my nation. I pray this prayer for those I struggle with. I pray this prayer for my enemies. Let's now conclude this time of guided prayer by praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Receive now the charge and benediction. In victory and defeat, in trial and error, in the ups and in the downs, choose to be a man, a woman, or child after God's heart. Believe in Christ. Love one another. That's the heartbeat of our faith. Learn it by heart. Live wholeheartedly with an open heart. Don't let your heart become hardened. 
cross your heart, hope to live. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. And all God's children said, Amen.